Hello, listening squirrels. <clears throat> Sorry. Chapter 7 of The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie. When they were outside Jefferson's door, Superintendent Harper said, Well, for what it's worth, we've got a motive, sir. Hmm? Said Melchett. 50,000 pounds, eh? Yes, sir. Murder's been done for a good deal less than that. Yes, but... Colonel Melchett left the sentence unfinished. Harper, however, understood him. You don't think it's likely in this case? Well, I don't either as far as that goes, but... But it's got to be gone into all the same. Oh, of course, Harper went on. If, as Mr. Jefferson says, Mr. Gaskell and Mrs. Jefferson are already well provided for... And in receipt of a comfortable income, well, it's not likely they'd set out to do a brutal murder. Quite so. Their financial standing will have to be investigated, of course. Can't say I like the appearance of Gaskell much. Looks a sharp, unscrupulous sort of fellow, but that's a long way from making him out a murderer. Oh, yes, sir, as I say, I don't think it's likely to be either of them. And from what Josie said, I don't see how it would have been humanly possible. They were both playing bridge from 20 minutes to 11 until midnight. No, to my mind, there's another possibility much more likely. Melchett said, boyfriend of Ruby King's? That's it, sir. Some disgruntled young fella, not too strong in the head, perhaps. Someone I'd say she knew before she came here. This adoption scheme, if he got wise to it, may just have put the lid on things. He saw himself losing her, saw her being removed to a different sphere of life altogether, and he went mad and blind with rage. He got her to come out and meet him last night, had a row with her over it, lost his head completely, and did her in. And how did she come to be in Bantry's library? I think that's feasible. They were out, say, in his car at the time. He came to himself, realized what he had done, and his first thought was how to get rid of the body. Say they were near the gates of a big house at the time. The idea comes to him if she's found there. The hue and cry will center around the house and, and its occupants and will leave him comfortably out of it. She's a little bit of a thing. He could easily carry her. He's got a chisel in the car. He forces a window and plops her down on the hearth rug. Being a strangling case, there's no blood or mess to give him away in the car. See what I mean, sir? Oh, yes, Harper, it's all perfectly possible, but still one thing to be done. What? What? Oh, very good, sir. Superintendent Harper tactfully applauded his superior's joke. He said something in French. And I can't say it. It's two words. So, uh, although owing to the excellence of Colonel Melchett's French accent, he almost missed the sense of the words. Oh, or I say, or could I speak to you a minute? It was George Bartlett who thus waylaid the two men. Colonel Melchett, who was not attracted to Mr. Bartlett and who was anxious to see how Slack had got on with the investigation of the girls' room, and the questioning of the chambermaids barked sharply, Well, what is it? What is it? Young Mr. Bartlett retreated a step or two, opening and shutting his mouth and giving an unconscious imitation of a fish in a tank. Well, uh, probably isn't important. Don't know. Don't you know? Thought I ought to tell you. Matter of fact, can't find my car. What do you mean, can't find your car? Stammering a good deal, Mr. Bartlett explained that what he meant was that he couldn't find his car. Superintendent Harper said, Do you mean it's been stolen? George Bartlett turned gratefully to the more placid voice. Well, that's just it, you know. I mean, one can't tell, can one? I mean, someone may just have buzzed off in it, not meaning any harm, if you know what I mean. When did you see it, Mr. Bartlett? Well, I was trying to remember. Funny how difficult it is to remember anything, isn't it? <laughs> sure is. <laughs> Colonel Melchett said coldly, Not, I should 
think to a normal intelligence i understood you to say just now that it was in the courtyard of the hotel last night mr bartlett was bold enough to interrupt he said that's just it was it what do you mean by was it you said it was well i mean i thought it was i mean well i didn't go out and look don't you see Colonel Melchett sighed. He summoned all his patience. He said, let's get this quite clear. When was the last time you saw, actually saw, your car? What make is it, by the way? Hmm. M-I-N-O-A-N 14. And you last saw it when? George Bartlett's Adam's apple jerked convulsively up and down. Been trying to think. I had it before lunch yesterday, was going for a spin in the afternoon, but somehow, you know how it is, went to sleep instead. Then after tea, had a game of squash and all that, and a bath afterwards, and the car was then in the courtyard of the hotel. Suppose so, I mean, that's where I'd put it. Thought, you see, I'd take someone for a spin. After dinner, I mean, but it wasn't my lucky evening, nothing doing, never took the old bus out after all. Harper said, but as far as you knew, the car was still in the courtyard. Well, naturally, I mean, I'd put it there. What? Would you have noticed if it had not been there? Mr. Bartlett shook his head. I don't think so. You know, lots of cars going and coming and all that, plenty of whatever kind of car that is. Superintendent Harper nodded. He had just cast a casual glance out of the window. There were at the moment no less than eight of those cars in the courtyard. It was the popular cheap car of the year. Aren't you in the habit of putting your car away at night? Asked Colonel Melchett. Don't usually bother, said Mr. Bartlett. Fine weather and all that, you know. Such a fag putting a car away in a garage. Glancing at Colonel Melchett, Superintendent Harper said, I'll join you upstairs, sir. I'll just get hold of Sergeant Higgins, and he can take down the particulars for Mr. Bartlett. Right, Harper. Mr. Bartlett murmured wistfully, thought I'd ought to let you know, you know, might be important. What? Mr. Prescott had supplied his additional dancer with board and lodging. Whatever the board, the lodging was the poorest the hotel possessed. Josephine Turner and Ruby Keene had occupied rooms at the extreme end of a mean and dingy little corridor. The rooms were small, faced north onto a portion of the cliff that backed the hotel and were furnished with the odds and ends of suites that had once, some 30 years ago, represented luxury and magnificent in the best suites. Now, when the hotel had been modernized and the bedrooms supplies, supplied with built-in receptacles for clothing, these large Victorian oak and mahogany wardrobes were relegated to those rooms occupied by the hotel's resident staff or given to guests in the height of the season when all the rest of the hotel was full. As Melchett saw at once, the position of Ruby King's room was ideal for the purpose of leaving the, ho the hotel without being observed and was particularly unfortunate from the point of view of throwing light on the circumstances of that departure. At the end of the corridor was a small staircase which led down to an equally obscure corridor on the ground floor. Here there was a glass door which led out onto the side entrance of the hotel, an unfrequent, unfrequented terrace with no view. You could go from it to the main terrace in front, or you could go down a winding path and come out in a lane that eventually rejoined the, rejoined the cliff road farther along, its surface being bad it was seldom used. Inspector Slack had been busy harrying cham chambermaids and examining Ruby's room for clues. He had been lucky enough to find the room exactly as it had been left the night before. Ruby Keene had not been in the habit of rising early. Her usual procedure, Slack discovered, was to sleep until about ten or half-past and then ring for breakfast. 
Consequently, since Conway Jefferson had begun his rep representations to the manager very early, the police had taken charge of things before the chambermaids had touched the room. They had actually not been down that corridor at all. The other rooms there at this season of the year were only opened and dusted once a week. That's all to the good as far as it goes, Slack explained gl gloomily. It means that if there were anything to find, we'd find it, but there isn't anything. Sinuses. Sun's going away. It's all cloudy. It's still a good day. The Glenshire police had already been over the room for fingerprints, but there were none accounted for. Ruby's own. Josie's and the two chambermaids, one on the morning and one on the evening shift. There was also a couple of prints made by Raymond Starr, but these were accounted for by his story that he had come up with Josie to look for Ruby when she did not appear for the midnight exhibition dance. There had been a heap of letters and general rubbish in the pigeonholes of the ma massive mahogany desk in the corner. Slack had just been carefully sorting through them, but he found nothing of a suggestive nature. Bills, receipts, theater programs, cinema stubs, newspaper cuttings, beauty hints torn from magazines. Of the letters, there were some from Lil, apparently a friend from the Palace de Dance, recounting various affairs and gossip, saying they missed Rube a lot. Mr. Fendison asked after you ever so often, quite put, quite put out he is. Young Reg has taken up with May now you've gone. Barney asked after you now and then, things going much as usual. Old Grouser still as mean as ever with us girls. He ticked off Ada for going out with the fella. Slack had carefully noted all the names mentioned. Inquiries would be made, and it was possible some useful information might come to light. To this, Colonel Melch had agreed. So did Superintendent Harper, who had joined them. Otherwise, the room had little to yield in the way of information. Across a chair in the middle of the room was the foamy pink dance frock Ruby had worn early in the evening with a pair of pink satin high-heeled shoes kicked off carelessly on the floor. Two sheer silk stockings were rolled into a ball and flung down. One had a ladder in it. A run. Melchett recalled that the dead girl had had bare feet and legs. This, Slack learned, was her custom. She used makeup on her legs instead of stockings, and only sometimes wore stockings for dancing by this means saving expense. The wardrobe door was open and showed a variety of rather flashy evening dresses and a row of shoes below. There were some soiled underwear in the clothes basket, some nail parings, Soiled face cleaning, cleaning tissue and bits of cotton wool stained with rouge and nail polish in the waste paper basket. In fact, nothing out of the ordinary. The facts seemed plain to read. Plain to read. Ruby Keen had hurried upstairs, changed her clothes, and hurried off again. Where? Josephine Turner, who might be supposed to know most of Ruby's life and friends had proved unable to help. But this, as Inspector Slack pointed out, might be natural. If what you tell me is true, sir, about this adoption business, I mean, well, Josie would be all for Ruby breaking with any old friends she might have had, who might queer the pitch, so to speak. As I see it, this invalid gentleman gets all worked up about Ruby Keene being such a sweet, innocent, childish little piece of goods. Now, supposing Ruby's got a tough boy, a tough boyfriend, that won't go down so well with the old boy, so it's Ruby's business to keep that dark. 
Josie doesn't know much about the girl anyway, not, not about her friends and all that, but one thing she wouldn't stand for, Ruby's messing up things by carrying on with some undesirable fellow. So, it stands to reason that Ruby, in parentheses, who, as I see it, was a sly little piece, would keep very dark about seeing any old friend. She wouldn't let on to Josie anything about it. Otherwise, Josie would say, No, you don't, my girl. But you know what girls are, especially young ones, always ready to make a fool of themselves over a tough guy. Ruby wants to see him. He comes down here, cuts up rough about the whole business, and wrings the girl's neck. I expect you're right, Slack, said Colonel Melchett, disguising his usual repugnance for the unpleasant way Slack had of putting things. If so, we ought to be able to discover this tough friend's identity fairly easy. easily. You leave it to me, sir, said Slack with his usual confidence. I'll get a hold of this little girl at the palace to dance place and turn her right inside out. We'll soon get at the truth. Colonel Melchett wondered if they would. Slack's energy and activity always made him feel tired. There's one other person you might be able to get a tip from, sir, went on Slack, and that's the dance and tennis pro fella. He must have seen a lot of her, and he'd know more about he'd know more than Josie would. Likely enough she'd loosen her tongue a bit to him. I've already discussed the point with Superintendent Harper. Uh, good, sir. I've done the chambermaids pretty thoroughly. They don't know a thing. Look down on these two as far as I can make out. Scamp, scamp the service as much as they dared. Chambermaid was in here last at 7 o'clock last night when she turned down the bed and drew the curtains and cleared up a bit. There's a bathroom next door if you'd like to see it. The bathroom was situated between Ruby's room and the slightly larger room occupied by Josie. It was illuminating. Colonel Melchett silently marveled at the amount of aids to beauty that women could use. Rows of jars of face cream, clean, cleansing cream, vanishing cream, skin feeding cream. Boxes of different shades of powder, an untidy heap of every variety of lipstick, hair lotions and brightening, hair lotions and brightening applications, eyelash black, mascara, blue, blue stain for under the eyes, at least 12 different shades of nail varnish, Face tissues, bits of cotton wool, dirty, dirty powder puffs, oh, okay. Bottles of lotion, astringent, tonic, soothing, etc. Do you mean to say, he muttered feebly, that women use all these things? Inspector Slack, who always knew everything, kindly enlightened him. In private life, sir, so to speak, a lady keeps to one or two distant shades, one for evening, one for day. They knew what suits them, and they keep to it. But these professional girls, they have to ring a change, so to speak. They do exhibition dances, and one night it's a tango, and the next a crinoline Victorian dance, and then a kind of Apache dance. And then just ordinary ballroom, and of course the makeup varies a good a good bit. Good Lord, said the Colonel, no wonder the people who turn out these creams and messes make a fortune. <laughs> easy money, that's what it is, said Slack, easy money. Got to spend a bit in advertisement, of course. Colonel Melchett jerked his mind jerked his mind away from the fascinating and age-long problem of women's adornments, he said to Harper, who had just joined them. There's still this dancing fellow, young pigeon superintendent. I suppose so, sir. As they went downstairs, Harper asked, uh, What do you think of Ms. Mr. Bartlett's story, sir? About his car? I think, Harper, that that young man wants watching. 
It's a fishy story, supposing that he did take Ruby Keen out in that car last night after all. He does seem suspicious, doesn't he? So it's probably not. Superintendent Harper's manner was slow and pleasant and absolutely noncommittal. These cases where the police of two counties had to collaborate were always difficult. He liked Colonel Melchett and considered him an able chief constable, but he was nevertheless glad to be tackling the present interview by himself. Never do much at never do much at once. Never do much at once was Superintend Superintendent Harper's rule. Bare routine inquiry for the first time that left the persons you were interviewing relieved and predisposed then to be more in guard than the next interview you had with them. Harper already knew Raymond Starr by sight, a fine-looking specimen, tall, lithe, and good-looking, with very white teeth in a deeply in a deeply bronzed face. He was dark and graceful. He had a pleasant, friendly manner and was very popular in the hotel. I'm afraid I can't help you much, Superintendent. I knew Ruby quite well, of course. She'd been here over a month and we had practiced all our dances together and all that. But there's really little, very little to say. She was quite a pleasant and rather stupid girl. It's her, it's her friendships. We're particularly anxious to know about her friendships with men. So I suppose. Well, I don't know anything. She got a few young men in tow. Uh, in the, in the hotel, but nothing special. You see, she was already, she was nearly already monopolized by the Jefferson family. Yes, the Jefferson family, Harper paused meditatively. He shot a shrewd glance at the young man. What did you think of that business, Mr. Starr? Raymond Starr said coolly, what business? Harper said, did you know that Mr. Jefferson was proposing to adopt Ruby King Blood? legally. This appeared to be news to Star. He he pursed up his lips and whistled. He said, the clever little devil. Oh, well, there's no fool like an old fool. That's how it strikes you, is it? Well, what else can one say? If the old boy wanted to adopt someone, why didn't he pick upon a girl of his own, own class? Excuse me. I do love a Diet Pepsi. Yum. I have been drinking water, though. Ruby King never mentioned the matter, do you? No, she didn't. I knew she was elated about something, but I didn't know what it was. And Josie? Oh, I think Josie must have known what was in the wind. Probably. She was the one who planned the whole thing. Josie's no fool. She got a head on her, that girl. Harper nodded. It was Josie who had sent for Ruby King. Josie, no doubt, who had encouraged the intimacy. No wonder she had been upset when Ruby, when Ruby had failed to show up for her dance that night and Conway Jefferson had begun to panic. She was in, in this, in this saging? I don't know what that is. Her plan's going awry, he asked. Could Ruby keep a secret, do you think? As well as most, she didn't talk about her own affairs much. Did she ever say anything, anything at all? About some friend of hers, someone from her former life who was coming to see her? see her here or whom she had difficulty with you know the sort of thing I mean no doubt I know perfectly well as far as I'm aware there was no one of the kind not by anything she ever said 
thank you, Mr. Star. Now, will you just tell me in your own words exactly what happened last night? Certainly, Ruby and I did our 1030 dance together. No signs of anything unusual about her then? Raymond considered. I don't think so. I didn't notice what uh, happened afterwards. I had my own partners to look after. I do remember noticing she wasn't in the ballroom. At midnight, she hadn't turned up. I was very annoyed and went to Josie about it. Josie was playing bridge with the Jeffersons. Jeffersons. She hadn't any idea where Ruby was. And I think she got in a bit of a jolt. I noticed her shoot a quick, anxious glance at Mr. Jefferson. I persuaded the band to play another dance, and I went to the office and got them to ring up to Ruby's room. There wasn't any answer. I went back to Josie. She suggested that Rosie, Ruby... She suggested that Ruby's room, and she suggested that Ruby was perhaps asleep in her room. Idiotic suggestion, really, but it was meant for the Jeffersons, of course. She came away with me and said we'd go up together. Uh, yes, Mr. Starr, and what did she say when she was along with you? As far as I can remember, she looked very angry and said, Damn little fool, she can't do this sort of thing. It will ruin all her chances. Who's she with, do you know? I said that I hadn't mm, the least idea. The last I'd seen of her was dancing with young Bartlett. Josie said she wouldn't be with him. What can she be up to? She isn't with that film man, is she? Harper said sharply, Film man? Who was he? Raymond said, I don't know his name. He's never stayed here. Rather an unusual looking chap. Black hair and theatrical looking. He has something to do with uh, the film industry, I, I believe, or I believe, or so he told Ruby. He came over to dine here once or twice and danced with Ruby afterwards, but I don't think she knew him at all well. That's why I was surprised when Josie mentioned him. Mentioned him. I said I didn't think he'd been here tonight. Josie said, well, she must be out with someone. What on earth am I going to say to the Jeffersons? I said, what did it matter to the Jeffersons? And Josie said it did matter. And she said, too, that she'd never, she'd never give up, she'd never forgive Ruby if she went and messed things up. We'd got to Ruby's room by then. She wasn't, uh, Ruby's room. she wasn't there, of course, but she'd been there because the dress she'd been wearing was lying across a chair. Josie looked in the wardrobe, wardrobe and said she thought she'd put on her old white dress. Normally, she'd have changed back into black vel into a black velvet dress for our Spanish dance. I was pretty angry by, the, by this time at the way Ruby had let me down. Josie did her best to soothe me, and she said she'd dance herself so that old Prescott shouldn't get after us all. She went away and changed her dress, and we were down and did a good tango. Exaggerated style and quite showy, but not really too exhausting upon the ankles. Josie was very plucky about it, for it hurt her, I could see. After that, she asked me to help her. Uh, help her soothe the Jeffersons down. She said it was important, so of course I did what I could. Superintendent Harper nodded. He said, thank you, Mr. Starr. To himself, he thought it was important. I guess we're right. It was important, all right, 50,000 pounds. He watched Raymond Starr as the latter moved gracefully away. He went down to the uh, he went down the steps of the terrace, picking up a bag of tennis balls and a racket on the way. 
Mrs. Jefferson also carrying a racket. Joined him and they went towards the tennis courts. Excuse me, sir. Sergeant Higgins, rather breathless, arrived at Harper's side. The superintendent jerked from the train of thought he was following. Looks, looked startled. Message just came through for my young... Through for you from headquarters, sir. Labor reported this morning saw glare as a fire. Half an hour ago, they found a burnt-out car in a quarry. Vin's quarry, about two miles from here. Traces of a charred body inside. A flush came over Harper's heavy features. He said, What's come to Glenshire? An epidemic of violence? Don't tell me we're going to have to... We're going to have, we're going to have a rouse case now. He said, could they get the number of the car? No, sir, but we'll be, identi we'll be able to identify it, of course, by the engine number of M-I-N-O-A-N-14. They think it is. Oh, there you go. Chapter 7. And we'll be hopefully reading 8 tomorrow. And I'll be on in less than an hour and a half. Love ya. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.